Good day. I am Jude Aquino, the leader of this group. I am happy to show you our rendition of the Nibelung Genmi. This epic poem was written around the 1200s in the Middle High German. Its anonymous poet was likely from the region of Passau. In today's era, we should know more about these epic poems because these really help us know our past or our history as a whole world. So now, I'm gonna introduce you to the first online play that we're gonna have. The Nibelungen Lead, the online play. Grimhild and her brothers, Gunther, Gernot, and Geisler, grew up in Burgundy. Their parents, King Dancrat and Queen Yuoki, held court at Worms on the Rhine. Dancrat passed the kingship to his sons. Grimhild dreamed that she reared a falcon, but the two eagles tore it apart. She related this event to her mother. The falcon is a nobleman whom you will marry, but soon afterwards he will be taken from you. No, I intend to be a virgin, and I will not let my life be ruined through a love of a man. Be careful before making such a vow. True happiness only comes from a man's love. With you all this prediction, Grimhild did marry a noble warrior only to lose him through treachery. Her vengeance brought death to many, including her closest kinsmen. Siegfried, son of King Sigmund and Queen Sieglin, grew up in the city of Santen. Tidings of Kreimhild's beauty and nobility spread abroad. Prince Siegfried resolved that he would marry her, and set forth for Burgundy with twelve warriors outfitted with the best armor and weapons, which made a great impression on the Burgundians. Hagen immediately recognized him. This is mighty Siegfried. I do not know his purpose here, but we must treat him with respect. He is a great warrior who slew the Nibelungs then took possession of their treasure, a hoard so immense that it filled a hundred freight wagons, in addition to gold and precious stones. It also includes the famous sword Balmung. The dwarf, Alberith, keeper of the Nibelung treasure, attempted to avenge his former masters by attacking Siegfried, but to no avail. The brave prince overpowered him for fame then took from him the magic cloak of invisibility. Thereupon, Alberic swore loyalty to Siegfried, the new lord of the Nibelung treasure, and thus continued his post as keeper of the treasure. Furthermore, the great hero and prince slew a dragon and bathed in its blood. This made him invincible against all weapons. No mortal can defeat him in combat. This is why we must receive him with chivalry and honor and seek his friendship. Siegfried lived at their court for a year, but didn't see Grimhild. He proved his abilities in jousting tournaments by the royal Burgundian household. He came to their aid and led the counterattack when the Saxons attacked the Burgundians. He defeated them and returned to Burgundy to a hero's welcome. Siegfried first saw Grimhild standing at her window and observing the festival in celebration of the Burgundians' victory. As her beauty shone, he knew that this was the maiden of his dreams. He visited her every day and passed the time together. Queen Brunhild of Iceland's beauty had extended to Worms 
and known for her strength and skill at throwing a javelin, hurling away, and leaping a great distance. Any man who sought her was required to better her in these three contests, or else they lost their heads. Gunther announced his intention to woo Brunhild, and out of loyalty to his future brother-in-law, Siegfried agreed to assist him in his venture. The party sailed to the great fortress of Eisenstein, and Siegfried insisted that his own identity not be revealed and known as Gunther's vassal. In the contest, Siegfried puts on his invisibility cloak, which gives him extra strength to hurl a javelin, throw a boulder, and leap even farther than Brunhild does, although Gunther appeared to be the one doing this and defeats her. Brunhild had to accept Gunther's marriage proposal and agreed to return with him. Siegfried was sent ahead to announce the success of Gunther's venture, and Brunhild was welcomed in Worms with ceremonies held in her honor. However, Brunhild did not see Siegfried as royalty. She knew him only as Gunther's vassal. Why is your royal sister engaged to marry a mere vassal? He is a mighty king, as noble as myself. He has enormous power and great holdings. This quieted Brunhild, but did not still her uneasiness. Brunhild refused to share Gunther's bed unless he tells her all about Siegfried and they continued to quarrel. Unless you tell me the truth about Siegfried, I shall remain a virgin. Gunther grew angry and attempted to take her by force. With her strength, she bounded him, then hung him from a nail on the wall. The next morning, Gunther revealed to Siegfried that his wedding night had not met his expectations. Siegfried agreed again to aid his relative, and the invisible Siegfried entered their bedroom that night. Stop rumpling my shift! The invisible Siegfried wrestled and held her fast until she finally submitted to Gunther. He took a golden ring and embroidered girdle from Brunhild, then left them lying together. Later, Siegfried gave these to Grimhild. Siegfried returned with Grimhild to the city of Sandan. His aging father named him king and his wife became queen. They lived magnificently for 10 years while Brunhild still suffered from the suspicion that her sister-in-law had married beneath her station. She proposed to Gunther that Siegfried and Grimhild be invited to a great festival, and the invitation was extended. Siegfried and Grimhild returned to Worms. However, Brunhild's jealousy toward Grimhild soon manifested, and they fell to quarreling about the rank and merits of their husbands. Your husband calls himself a king? But he is nothing more than a vassal to my husband, a real king. Your husband is neither a real king nor a real man. Your so-called husband was not even man enough to take your maiden head on your wedding day. It was my husband who had to do that job for him. Prove it. Prove it, I shall. Here is the ring that he took from your finger that night, and here is the girdle that he took from your waist. Brunhild confronted Gunther with Grimhild's accusations, but nothing he said could comfort her. Hagen, King Gunther's faithful vassal, seeing his queen's distress, swore revenge against who caused her this grief. I shall kill him. It was well known that Siegfried was invincible against all normal weapons, having bathed in dragon's blood. 
However, it was rumored that he missed one spot in bathing. Hagen vowed to discover Siegfried's one vulnerable spot. Later, Hagen approached Grimhild and directed their conversation to any apprehension that she might have about the dangers Siegfried might face in war. Because of the dragon's blood, he is quite safe against any foe. Nonetheless, feel ill at ease for his sake. It is my responsibility to protect him from any danger. It would be better for me if I knew any way that he might be wounded. Perhaps you were right. He does have one small vulnerable spot. While he was bathing himself in the dragon's blood, a leaf fell from the tree onto his back, directly between his shoulder blades, keeping the blood away from that one spot. I think he might be vulnerable there. Could you sew a little mark on that clothing in that spot so that I would know where to protect him in the event of danger? Seeing no harm in this request, Grimehild sew a tiny cross at the critical spot on Siegfried's back. Soon afterward, Hagen proposed a hunt in a nearby forest and revealed to Gunther his plans. The hunt proceeded in an accustomed manner. As the day advanced, Siegfried stoops at a spring to take a drink and Hagen seizes the opportunity to stab him through the vulnerable spot. Siegfried quickly dies. The hunters conspired to conceal what actually happened. Siegfried rode off by himself and was killed by robbers. They would claim. Back in Worms, Hagen had Siegfried's body laid on the threshold of Krimhild's apartment. When Krimhild discovered the body, she suspected the truth about what transpired. Hagen committed this bloody crime, and it was Brunhild who urged him to do so. The guilty shall surely die. He was killed by robbers. Hagen did nothing wrong. At the cathedral, Hagen's guilt was proven when he stands next to the buyer, and blood miraculously flowed anew from Siegfried's wound. Krimhild swore to avenge Siegfried's death, however long it takes. Grimhild extended kindness to her in-laws, hoping to gain control over the Nibelung treasure. Recognizing that wealth brings power, Grimhild ordered that the treasure be brought to her from Nibelung land. With the treasure at her disposal, Grimhild gave gifts to many Burgundian knights, gaining their allegiance and favor. Hagen urged the Burgundian kings to confiscate the treasure, and disregarding their allegiance to their sister, they took the vast hoard from Grimhild. Soon afterward, the three kings had a journey to make. Hagen took the treasure during their absence, and sank in the Rhine at Lockheim. He intended to return someday and recover it, but this never happened. The story now turns to Hungary, to the domain of the great King Etzel. His wife having recently died, King Etzel decided to take a new queen. Tidings of the beautiful widow Krimhild had reached his land, and he resolved to woo her, although he was a heathen and she was a Christian. Rudiger, Margrave of Pocklarn, and a member of Etzel's court had known Krimhild since childhood, and he volunteered to carry Etzel's marriage proposal to the widowed queen in Worms. Accompanied by 500 knights, Rudiger made his way from Hungary to Vienna, then to his home at Pochlarn, 
and from thence across Bavaria to the Rhine. Their journey lasted 12 days and not once were they attacked by robbers. The Hunnish knights were received in worms with great courtesy, their leader Rudiger being well known to the three kings. They received King Edsel's marriage proposal with great favor. Only Higgins spoke out against it. I predict that if Kreimhild marries King Edsel, she will use her newly gained power to do as great harm. However, the Burgundian kings saw only benefits in a marriage between their sister and the Hunnish king, and they urged her to accept the proposal. At first, Grimhild was reluctant, she being a Christian and Edsel being a heathen, but she soon came to see a great benefit in this marriage for her as well. Edsel's great power would help her avenge the death of her late husband. She accepted the proposal and forthwith made preparations for the trip to Hungary. The journey took them first to pouring on the Danube, then to Passau where the inn joins the Danube, then onward toward Edsel's castle at Zomberg. Edsel and his entire court received their new queen with splendor, granting her every courtesy and honor. Edsel and Grimeheld married and they lived together in great luxury. In their seventh year together, Grimhild gave birth to a son, whom they named Ortlieb. Outwardly, Grimhild was content in her queenship, but inwardly, she never ceased brooding over the wrongs that had been committed against her at home, and in her mind, she plotted revenge against those who had been responsible. To this end, she decided to invite her brothers to visit her in Hungary. She selected two trusted minstrels, Werbel and Swemmel, to carry the invitation to Worms, instructing them that they must not tell her kinsmen that they had ever seen her sorrowing, and also that they must insist that Hagen accompany her brothers to Hungary. Werbel and Swemmel, accompanied by 24 warriors, journeyed up the Danube as far as Passau where they called on Bishop Pilgrim. I do not know what route they took from there to the Rhine, but no one robbed them of their goods underway. The Burgundians received them with courtesy and honor, presenting the two minstrels with generous gifts. King Gunder and most of his associates were inclined to accept the invitation to visit King Edsel and Queen Grimheld in Hungary. Only Hagen spoke out against the virtue. I, I was the one who killed Crimehild's husband with my very own hands. And now she will be seeking revenge against all of us. Our sister is no longer angry. If you lack the courage to go with us, then you can stay here in safety. I never lack courage. I shall go with you. He then assembled an army of 3,000 or more knights to accompany them on their journey. Little did the Burgundians know the tragedy that awaited them, although they were forewarned by Queen Wu. Do not go. Last night, I dreamed that all the birds in this town had died. We, we are moved by honor, not by dreams. And they continued their preparations for the journey ahead. The Nibelongs, as the Burgundians were now called, rode through Swabia, and no one robbed them. On the twelfth day, they arrived at the Danube. The great river had overflowed its banks, and no ferries could be found. While looking for a possible fording place, Hagen came upon a group of water fairies batting in the water. As he approached, they fled, leaving their clothes behind, and the warrior immediately took possession of their garments. One of the nixies called to him. Noble knights, give us back our clothes and we will tell your fortune. He agreed to this, and one of the fairies said, You can ride on with confidence. Great glory will come to you in Etzel's land. Satisfied with this prediction, 
Hagen returned the clothing to them. No sooner had they put on their marvelous garments, one of the fairies taunted, My cousin lied to you. You're riding into a trap. None of you shall return alive from Hungary. Only King Gunther's chaplain shall be spared. Soon afterward, the Nibelungs found a ferryman, but he was unwilling to take them across the swollen Danube. This angered Hagen, who struck off the ferryman's head and confiscated his boat. One boatload at a time, he ferried the travelers across the river. Their horses swam across, and although the current carried them far downstream, not one of them was lost. The royal chaplain was in the last boat. Seeing him, Hagen remembered the Nixie's prediction. I shall prove her wrong. Others tried to rescue him, while Hagen repeatedly pushed him underwater. The struggling chaplain turned back toward the shore, although he could not swim. Miraculously, he safely made his way to the bank. Seeing this, Hagen now knew that he and his fellow knights were doomed to die. After the ferry boat had been unloaded the last time, Hagen smashed it to pieces. The Nibelongs loaded their gear onto their horses and continued onward toward Hungary. The royal chaplain made his way back to Burgundy on foot. Many days later, the Nibelongs arrived in Hungary and they were received for the most part, with expected courtesy. When Quirmel greeted the royal party, she kissed only Geisler, her youngest brother. Hagen responded to this life by tightening his helmet straps. What have you brought me from the Rhine? Where is the treasure of the Nibelungs? It is rightfully mine. That is what you should have brought here. My lords commanded that it shall be sunk in the Rhine. And there it shall remain forever. Tension between the Nibelungs and the Hungarians increased at every turn. Hagen, especially, became ever more reckless and provocative. He appeared in public wearing Siegfried's sword, Balmain, which Grimhild recognized at once. She confronted him forthwith. Why did you slay my husband? Yes, it was I who killed Siegfried. I did so for the pain that you had caused against my mistress, Brunhild. And if anyone wants avenge against this act of mine, man or woman, then let him or her try. Meanwhile, King Exel had prepared a jousting festival in honor of his guests. The celebration commenced on Midsummer's Day with the mass in the cathedral. However, being heathens, the Hungarians sang the mass differently than did the Christians. Then the jousting began, and at one of the first events, a Burgundian knight named Volker, armed with a pointed spear, not a blunted one as peaceful jousting requires, ran his Hunnish opponent through, killing him instantly. The dead knight's countrymen responded with a great outcry, and would have attacked the Burgundians Forthwith had King Edsel not held them back. His sense of honor would not allow guests at his court to be harmed. It was an accident. Volker's horse stumbled, causing the mishap. Counter to her husband's attempts at peacemaking, Kreenhald continued to plot means to bring the Burgundians and the Hungarians into a full pitch battle, and thus punish her brothers and Hagen for their complicity in the death of her husband and the theft of her treasure. Seeing no other way to start a fight between the two armies, she had her son Ortli brought forth. She knew that Hagen would react violently against the young prince, seeing in him a future enemy with great power, and one who would carry out his mother's wishes for revenge. Grimald's dreadful prediction came true. For the reasons foreseen by her, Hagen flew into a rage when he saw her son. He drew his sword and with one blow cut off the boy's head. A great slaughter ensued. Hungarians and Nibelungs battled against each other. Each side lost many brave warriors, but the Nibelungs were greatly outnumbered. And in the end, 
every one of them was killed. Gondor and Hagen were the last to die. Both were captured by the Hungarians. Krimhild ordered that Gondor said be cut off and then delivered to Hagen. Following this grisly act, Krimhild herself, now armed with the sword Balmung, struck off Hagen's head. Her revenge was complete, although it had come at a terrible price. One old knight, Hildebrand by name, serving at Etzel's court, was horrified that such a brave warrior as Hagen be killed by a woman. He drew his own sword and killed Grimhelm. King Etzel mourned deeply. I do not know what happened afterward. Here ends the story of the Nibelung's last stand.